This is Glenn Worthy once again, building legal literacies for text data mining. Next, we're going to talk through some specific examples of co contracts and licenses that are often highly relevant to TDM practitioners, library e-resource licenses. This section is based largely on some practical real-life examples of library licenses as they relate to TDM. They're not all pretty, but I hope they'll be instructive. The world of library licensing for e-resources can seem both complicated and shrouded in mystery. Often this is just a matter of the complexities of back office uh, li library acquisitions processes, selection, negotiation, signing, paying, getting access, setting up proxy servers, etc., and the feeling that nobody except those directly involved really needs to know how this particular sausage is made. But sometimes the mystery is intentional. Many licenses and the negotiations leading up to their signing are subject to non-disclosure agreements. These NDAs are imposed by vendors who don't want libraries to compare the supposedly great deals they're being offered with deals offered to other libraries. I suppose some might find the secretive price setting to be a legitimate business practice, although I found pricing often so irregular that it often seems to border on the fictional. But many people, myself included, find NDAs pretty pernicious for other reasons as well, especially where the non-price terms are concerned. As we've seen, license terms can often curtail drastically some very important rights in areas of scholarship like TDM. There's been a movement in universities to ban entering into contracts subject to NDAs, and I confess that I was pretty proud and happy when my former university did that several years ago. I don't remember whether those, these particular licenses that I'm using as illustrations came before or after our NDA ban, but I'm doing my best to obscure the vendor's identities just in case. By the way, how do you like my colorful illustrations here? They're of course meant to convey the utter dreariness of the license reading experience. But in case you're tempted, as I too often am, to escape back into volume three of War and Peace or the multi-volume classic of your choice, let me tell you that there are some truly important and not at all uninteresting aspects, at least in many of the ways of interest in this workshop. In spite of their difficulties, I would encourage you to ask around your libraries to find and talk to the people who negotiate and maintain licenses because they're so important to what we do. As Kyle has described, licenses are a form of contract. In his memorable formulation, a license is a contract not to sue. But library licenses for electronic resources generally have a substantial set of terms, consequential terms, long before anyone gets to the point of suing. I think we should care about these licenses for at least two very important reasons. One is that they are, broadly speaking, licenses, licenses to read, including the specific type of reading to which this workshop is dedicated, text data mining as reading. Another is that we are all bound by these licenses when we read, whether we know it or not. And yet, how many non-librarian scholars or students do you think have ever seen or thought about or even know of the existence of these licenses? In my experience, not very many. Even among librarians, it's rare that someone outside of a few, very few acquisitions people or a special licensing librarian has seen them. How many people in the campus community generally know that they're bound by the terms of a license that some hidden librarian has secretly signed on their behalf that they don't agree to and haven't even seen? To engage in a bit of stereotyping, I've seen several different categories of reactions among users of licensed e-resources. First, I think the vast majority is largely apathetic. They don't know and don't care, and that's generally okay. Their use of e-resources is pretty well covered by pretty much any license that the library may have signed for them. Actually, one place that almost everyone on campus bumps into e-resource licenses is when we, they try to set up off-campus access. What a system. We paid many hundreds of thousands of dollars for digital content that were required to lock down then spend tens of thousands more to set up systems to unlock those things for our users. After which they spend thousands of precious scholar hours trying to make the systems actually work. But I digress. At the institutions I've been part of, the range of knowledge about these licenses includes bold ignorance, the savvy grad student who knows how to script and how to scrape, and generally believes that if whoever put this stuff on the web didn't want them to scrape it, they wouldn't have made it so easy. Or fear. They don't even bother asking for TDM access because what if someone gets into trouble? Or even outrage that we librarians have agreed to license to a license that forbids them from doing TDM-based research. You'd think with so many lengthy, carefully crafted pages and strict legalese that library licenses would be watertight, but far from it. This license, for example, from a major vendor seems to include two distinctly contradictory terms on the very same page. The first one, that users may extract and compile data from the resource, seems expressly to permit something like data mining, but the second seems expressly to prohibit it. Not only are there many of these licenses uh, that are dense and difficult to read, they're also often a real mess. But with practice, you can learn to spot the problematic terms. 
Do workshop readings include a sample of a problematic license, along with a good model license, which we'll touch on in a few minutes for comparison. Once we understand that a license is a voluntary contract, there are some important aspects to the licensing process that can play in our favor. Complementary interests. For example, the vendor has a commercial interest. It wants to make a sale, and the library and its scholars have an academic interest. We want access to the vendor's content. So although we may have competing interests in the price, we really have common interests in finding agreeable terms. Unfortunately, many vendors either don't yet understand TDM practices or appreciate or really appreciate their importance. Likewise, many of these vendors are third parties selling content that they themselves may have licensed from the actual copyright holders. Naturally, the easiest and safest position for a vendor to take is a restrictive one. But it's essential for us to push back. While I don't have any special tricks for negotiating licenses, I do strongly believe in a couple of principles. First, the right to read is the right to text mine, and it's a right we should never willingly sign away. Some have advocated for the inclusion of a simple escape clause in our license along the lines of, notwithstanding the foregoing, nothing in this license should be read to prohibit fair use. Since the courts have ruled that TDM is generally a fair use, this clause should, in theory, allow us what we need. The second principle is to maintain the clear position that one of the primary affordances of electronic texts is the ability to read them with a computer, that is, to do TDM. If the only allowable uses are pretty much the same uses we could have done with print books, many of which we have in our collections anyway, why on earth would we spend these huge sums of money for an electronic copy? Mere convenience of access shouldn't cost nearly this much. Finally, for these very reasons, it's crucial to be prepared to walk away from negotiations if the terms aren't right. But these days, there's no need for anyone, vendor or librarian, to draft a license completely from scratch. In fact, it's better if they don't. One important innovation in recent years is the model license, which various research library consortia have developed and adapted as an expression of what the community considers reasonable expectations for licensing terms. Both the Center for Research Libraries and NURL, the Northeast Research Libraries Consortium, and the California Digital Library offer model licenses that are available to all, vendor and librarian alike, to use as references, sources for terms, or even straight out adoption. These model licenses are important for several reasons. Not only do they lighten the load of drafting from scratch, even more importantly, I would argue, they set general expect expectations that are shared by the community. For example, both of these model licenses present as a given that research libraries expect to have text data mining terms and particular kinds of terms in their vendor licenses. In this way, vendors, many of whom have historically been quite unfriendly to the whole idea of text mining, are put on notice that ap academic expectations are clear on this topic. The California Digital Library's model license has, no surprise, particularly good terms for TDM, including both explicit mention of TDM as an authorized use and a fair use escape clause. This and other model licenses I've mentioned are incredibly important resources, both tactically and strategically. Because they originate in the academy, they're favorable to academic uses. Unlike commercial licenses, which are generally written from a strong protectionist instinct and with commercial interests foremost, and strategically, model licenses serve to put our vendors on notice that these are terms our community and growing numbers expect and will demand. Although I've advocated taking a tough TDM stance with vendors in the negotiation of licenses, I do think there's real value in establishing good relations with them. They have something that we want and need, and they exercise control over it, whether we like it or not. Remember Brandon Butler's blog post, Among Your Readings, reminding us that possession is nine-tenths of the law when it comes to data. In my experience, what happens when we don't have TD good TDM license terms, or if we do have good terms, if we haven't exercised them, or if we haven't informed our community about them, is that scholars will inevitably find a way to get or to attempt to get what they want by scraping or some other systematic means. This has happened frequently enough in my time as a librarian that I suspect it's fairly widespread. The most immediate consequence of a vendor discovering what it consist considers to be illegal downloading is to shut off access to the entire campus. With good vendor relationships, the librarians I've worked with have been able both to track down the offender with an explanation of the problem, and hopefully with some potential license or fair use enabled alternatives, and at the same time to reassure the vendor who generally opens things up again. A real hassle, but relatively minor in the scheme of things. It's better to negotiate clear terms up front and to make sure our users know about them. Another reason to establish and maintain good relations with our vendors, aside from simple human decency, is so that we can confidently approach them with requests for data or special access. And chances are, at least in my experience, that they'll do their best against tradition and their protectionist instincts to honor the request. 
After all, they really do want to make another sale, in addition to often being perfectly nice and collegial people. There's obviously much more to be said about library licenses, but I hope these examples will encourage you to approach them thoughtfully, boldly, and without much too, too much fear or loathing.